Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Kea. Today, we're looking at fully quality to fair and public hearing, Article 10, Independent and Impartial Tribunal. We're fortunate enough to be able to look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which guarantees everyone on Earth is entitled to a fair and public hearing by an independent partial tribunal regarding any criminal charge. We're so fortunate to be able to talk with the Deputy Asia Director of Human Rights Watch, Phil Robertson. Phil, can you tell us the state of Article 10 around Asia? Uh, Joshua, thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, you know, this is an issue that we look at all the time. Uh, there are a number of different uh, countries which have judiciaries which have effectively been captured by the ruling party and the government. Uh, you know, uh, single party states like Vietnam and Laos uh, or uh, Cambodia, where the it claims it's a democracy, but in fact, uh, it, it resembles Vietnam and, and Laos in the sense that there is one party that's a complete troll. Uh, even countries like uh, Thailand, which has a multi-party democracy, you know, there are certain issues that come up before the uh, judiciary that I think uh, the judiciary is influenced on. So you know, when we talk about this actual right, Article 10, you know, a fair and public hearing, you know, many places, for instance, in Cambodia, uh, it's pretty clear that person who is being taken to trial is going to be found guilty. Uh, particularly for any sort of uh, offense connected to civil and political rights and the exercise of people's efforts to you know, express their views or criticize the government or try to uh, peacefully publicly assemble, uh, you know, organize a protest. But these sort of things are gov the, the sort of issues that governments frown on. And they use these uh, courts and these trials uh, to basically impose their will on people and claim that everything is done according to uh, rule of law. In fact, a lot of times it's rule by law and rule by law, meaning that whatever the government or the, the ruling party says is the law uh, will be enforced by the by the judiciary. People have actually talked about weaponization of the judiciaries um, in places like Vietnam, for instance, uh, you know, it's a single party communist state and uh, you know, these people are being taken into these trials where oftentimes they don't even have access to their lawyer until like uh, two weeks before the trial. Uh, they spend as, as long as a, a, a year in pretrial detention. And uh, oftentimes their relatives or others are prevented from even attending the trial. Uh, the, the trials are usually over in a matter of a couple hours uh, with uh, long prison sentences imposed, often on politically motivated charges. You know, so this is not uh, a fair and public hearing. Uh, it's not an independent, impartial tribunal, and and quite clearly, you know, uh, a lot of these times, what they would fall into what we would call arbitrary arrest, which is Article Nine of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You know, the the Article Nine, Article Ten, and Article Eleven of the UDHR are all sort of connected because they all deal with these issues can, uh, of of fair and public hearings and independent, impartial tribunals. And you know, many of these people. For instance, in Article 11, you know, there's the right to be presumed innocent until uh, proved guilty according to law. Well, you know, the fact that these people are being taken into uh, these courts uh, presumes that they're guilty. Um, it, you know, there's a there's a there's a lot of real uh, need for a judicial reform uh, and getting a lot of these judiciaries out of the clutches of the political elites who control uh, some of these governments. Um Otherwise, you know, this the whole idea of Article 10, frankly, no matter what the government says, you know, and whether it ratifies relevant international treaties connected to uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, even if they ratify those things, uh, like Laos has done, uh, it's quite clear that there's no real effective implementation. Thank you so much. And that does lead to the next aspect. Chuming, we thank you so much for joining us. Can you share why this issue is so important in international human rights law and share a bit of why it's central and core to your life and your work for human rights? Thank you. Uh, thank you for, um, for letting me join this panel. Uh, I think the Univ Dec Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, is an important, important uh, reminder 
that even though many countries have adopted or rectified the, this uh, uh, convention, uh, very few in this part of the world have actually um, implemented it. We are talking about this uh, Article 10, and it relates very much to my own experience. Uh, Sombat Sompon, my husband, was and the disappearance now uh, to come to his 11th year. Now, in Laos, the rule of law actually does not exist. It's as Phil say, it's ruled by law. And most people don't even know what their rights are under the law, even though the government has um, the constitution and has the judiciary, it is not functioning. It just does not work. And in the specific case of my husband, he doesn't even have a chance um, to even appear in a court for whatever um, uh, law he has broken because he has just disappeared. And this is, makes even things even worse and makes even a greater mockery of the uh, issue of the rule of law. And therefore, Article 10, 11, or, uh, and all the, actually all the articles under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, Laos have just ignored it. And for ordinary people, ordinary citizens in Laos, uh, those articles don't apply to, to them. And my husband is a victim, a victim of this violation of his rights. He's not even given a chance to even stand up and speak for himself, even in a kangaroo court. There's, he cannot even talk about it. He is not even given that right. And therefore, for me, um, talking about Article 10, um, while it is, I think, important and relevant, uh, for me, it is very painful to think about that all these years, my husband um, does not even have that right. And the worst part is under enforced disappearance, we don't even know uh, where he is. And that unknown is a major, major, um, uh, actually, act of torture. It's an act of torture against somebody himself who has been disappeared, but it's an, also an act of torture to me as his wife and to the family members. I'll leave it at that. And if you have other questions, please continue. Thank you. Phil, could you share with us a bit of why Sombat Sompong's case is so important to all the people of Laos, but also of Asia and the entire world? Well, Sombat Sompon uh, was really uh, an innovative development leader. And, um, you know, we're still searching for him. We're, we're hoping that we will ultimately find what has happened to him and, and, and be able to return him to Shui Meng and, and the family. Uh, but it's gone on 11 years now. Uh, we're coming up on the 11th anniversary of his enforced disappearance. Uh, he was taken uh, at a uh, police checkpoint in one of the main thoroughfares in the downtown of the capital city, Bianchan. Um, you know, we know that the uh, police took him because there's CCTV, which uh, Shui Meng uh, was able to unearth, which is actually government CCTV. She actually got it from a police station. Um, and, you know, he was last held by these police. Uh, you know, the government certainly knows what happened to them. But they're engaged in a massive cover-up. Um, and when you talk about enforced disappearance, it is as Shui Meng mentioned, it is it is torture. It is torture for the for the person involved, it is person for the for the family. You know, <clears throat> uh, even you know, uh, putting someone through a kangaroo court is preferable uh, to a person just being disappeared by government officials and never seen. Uh, you know, it, there's so many unanswered questions. So you know, when we talk about uh, 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 Sombat, you know, Sombat, as I mentioned, was a real innovative grassroots development leader, someone who was focused on uh, the whole issue of, uh, of rural development, uh, which is what the, the Lao people so desperately need. And, you know, involved in sort of innovative agricultural uh, practices. Um, he has so much to give to Laos, and and that those contributions were recognized uh, 
by in the region. He was he was awarded the Raymond Magsaysay Award, uh, which is a uh, you know the sort of Asian Nobel Prize. Um, and so, I mean, this is someone who is uh, as as senior as you can get within Lao civil society, and and for this sort of thing to happen to him uh, indicates very clearly uh, how lawless. Uh, the government of uh, Laos is, uh, how it uh, operates completely outside any sort of uh, international human rights law. Uh, and, you know, again, prompts us all to recognize that we have to do more uh, to demand that Laos uh, uh, tell us where somebody is and also to comply with its international human rights standards. I mean, Laos has uh, ratified these various different international human rights conventions of its own accord. You know, no one forced the Lao government to ratify these conventions. But, you know, once you ratify something, you need to comply with it. And quite clearly, Laos has not even lifted a finger to comply with uh, the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights, which contains the various uh, fleshed out guarantees on rights that were contained in Article 10 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Thank you, Phil. And it really reminds me of his important contribution, really in sustainable development, the UN Global Goals. He was a pioneer actually doing that, rooted in the culture of his people and guaranteed that everyone would have the right to food, to end poverty. And this story that began for both of you, Shuming, it was actually in Hawaii, right? Could you tell us where you met and how you were able to forge those beautiful bonds of love and, and a little bit about that beginning? Yes, um, Joshua, yes. Uh, Sombat was actually a graduate of the University of Hawaii. He graduated with a degree in agriculture. And the reason why he chose to study agriculture was because he wanted to use the knowledge and skills he learned from um, uh, in, in agriculture from a well-known university to go home to be able to impart that knowledge and skills to most of the people of Laos, um, like his parents. They are all farmers. They live off the land and they, are, you know, they need to improve their livelihoods to better production techniques, storage, and eventually to make a better living out of agriculture. That was his intention. And that's why he spent uh, time studying at the University of Hawaii uh, for, the universe, uh, for the degree in uh, agriculture. And while he was studying, he also specifically did research on using uh, organic fertilizers because he knew that uh, poor people like his uh, family and most of the farmers in Laos, they cannot afford uh, chemical fertilizers. And so his intention was to promote a system of agriculture that is um, organic and sustainable and will not also be harmful to the environment. He returned to Laos after he graduated with his degree and he worked with farmers and he experimented um, uh, using organic agriculture uh, in his own farm, his parents' farm, and also with uh, other communities. And he learned a lot. He always said that knowledge is nothing without practice. And he actually did a lot of real life practical work with the farmers, first in the area of agriculture, but then he also realized that agriculture is only one part of the uh, livelihoods of people. There are also other people, the women who are doing uh, handcrafts. And so he went into a holistic, sustainable community development. And he also realized in Laos, where the education level is quite low, where you know people don't have a lot of access to information under the um, the communist government uh, rule, they are only told what to do. He decided that one entry point to change uh, the situation is actually to work with young people. And his work brought him from agriculture to community development and then later focusing on uh, developing young people to be able to resolve issues or challenges in their own lives. 
So he worked really hard with um, involving young people and he got them to think about their own issues. His focus is to get young people to analyze the challenges they face. And then he used a lot of kind of activity, taking them to young people during school holidays to the villages to get them experience and taking young people from the villages to come and experience the life of uh, the more urban uh, areas and have exchanges and youth camps so that the young people of Laos can exchange and talk about their, that kind, their own experiences and the issues and the problems they face in their own lives. Uh, in their families or in the communities. So he was doing a lot of that. And I think that might be one of the reasons that the government is concerned because like really encouraging people to think and encouraging people to try and resolve their own problems and to ask, ask questions is something that a uh, authoritarian government does not like. I assume and I speculate that this is probably the reason why he was taken. He was too much of a symbol of a person, an ordinary person in Laos who can take action and try to mobilize people to resolve their own problems. Thank you so much. And Bill, coming back to Article 10, which NGOs do you think are champions to create a culture of human rights? And what other major heroes or sheroes of this right are there that you see in Asia and around the world? Well, I mean, I think there are many NGOs and civil society movements that are that are working on issues related to uh, fair and public hearings and independent and partial tribunals. Uh, you know, these are the these are groups that range from uh, environmentalists to development practitioners to uh, human rights activists activists to you know people who are working on land rights issues uh, you name it uh, across the region uh, you know this this actual right under Article Ten really sort of cuts across so many different areas um, you know uh, I, I was thinking about what what Shui Meng just said about uh, Sombat's work with the youth and and that you know encouraging them to think independently and to question may have been one of the reasons that the Lao government uh, took him away. Um, you know we see uh, it for instance in Vietnam. Uh, you know major issues connected to uh, the environmental movement there, where over the past uh, two to three years. Uh, most of the main people working on climate change and trying to decarbonize that economy uh, through uh, ending the use of coal-fired uh, power plants have now been hit uh, with uh, you know bogus politically motivated charges by the Vietnam government, claiming that they're involved in tax evasion. Um, you know this is just manufacturing charges. That are, of course, rubber stamped by the judiciary, which is not independent and partial, as you know, as a clear violation of Article 10 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and and sentencing them to prison. Uh, you know, going after people who uh, encourage uh, society to think in a different way, uh, the kind of people who are reformers. And uh, in this case, uh, in, in the case of Vietnam, these are issues now they're going to be coming up at the COP28 meeting, uh, because Vietnam is in line to receive as much as $15.5 billion in loans and, and, and grants uh, for their just energy transition program. And we've been saying all along that how can you have a just energy transition program if, in fact, the people who are working on that program and the people who are the civil society leaders who are engaged most in trying to lay out why Vietnam needs to change its energy matrix uh, are behind bars. Uh, it makes no sense. You know, so we've called, in fact, for a, a delay uh, in the implementation of the JetP program for Vietnam until all these civil society uh, activists are released. Um, and so far, Vietnam is just stonewalling both us and the international community and claiming that, you know, there was nothing political about these arrests when, in fact, we know that this is all about uh, the Vietnamese Communist Party uh, viewing these activists as some sort of threat to their power. So, 
across the region, uh, we see time and time again uh, that authoritarian governments, you know, claim that they're all about the rule of law, but really it's rule by law. And it's uh, the law being whatever they say it is, uh, and then expecting the courts to essentially rubber stamp dis political decisions that have been made by the authoritarians going after civil society activists who are trying to reform and make lives better for the ordinary people in those countries. That's a great point. And you can see that with the COP coming up with the first ever global stock take on nationally determined contributions. But also we know next year Laos will be reviewed with their sustainable development goals under the voluntary national review. Chuming, maybe you can share a bit. He was also using technology in great ways to make this knowledge accessible to make sure more people could participate and really popularizing human rights to make sure that everyone knows their rights and that they can be part of their positive future. Um, yes, uh, Sombat, um, knowing that he works in a situation where there is um, really no free media, the media is highly controlled and information flow is highly controlled. So um, he tried to find more innovative ways of getting information out to the people. So he made a lot of videos. Uh, some of these videos are just technical videos about, you know, how to improve the agriculture production, how to improve storage. He did a lot of that and then also uh, together with the videos, accompanied them with um, small uh, manuals and modules that um, even people with limited literacy can follow. And he did a lot of that, but he also did a lot of things about working in the schools and getting the schools to be more child friendly as a way to enter the school and to work with the teachers and to get them not to be so um, afraid of trying anything new. So he did a lot of work around these issues, but he also did a lot of work around the environment. He would um, go to the communities and then use, uh, in even 10 years ago when um, Google Map was first uh, in, he would ask the people to say, look, you know, do you want to see how your land looks like? And he would use Google Map and they would zoom in and then they'll be able to see uh, their own village and also the land they they work on. And he also uses the Lao law uh, to encourage the people to register their own land. He say that now the government has a law to register your land and he encourages them to register their land. So all this, it brings to his work and also getting the young people to be like volunteers to go from home to home and uh, use simple methods to teach the people how to protect their own uh, soil by you know and grow trees and he take the young people out to plant trees so like in Xiangquang, which has been uh, an area which was bombed and denuded he then mobilize the community working with young people to reforest entire hill slopes. Uh, many people uh, thought that this is a joke. How can you really try and reforest entire hill slope? But he did, partly because he asked the people what kind of plants were used to grow there, what kind of plants would uh, thrive there. And then he asked the, the community to also pitch in uh, to prepare the saplings and then he will have, you know, use the government's own um, uh, propaganda about tree planting and so on, but not just one day. He will mobilize them to go out and replant whole, whole hillsides. And you can see 10 years later, now uh, that he's gone for more than 10 years, uh, those hillsides are all reforested, reforested. And that is one way. He al Sombat always tried to do something which is practical. Sombat knew that he cannot challenge the government's authority, but he tried to use practical ways to get the people to think that they can resolve their own problems. So talking about um, forest um, uh, deforestation in a, in a more positive way, talking about, you know, restoring water systems in a positive way and how to protect the environment. And somebody in his writings also say, Laos 
the people of Laos depend a lot on nature. And if they destroy nature, they will actually undermine their own livelihoods. And this is one way he demonstrate and work with the people to, you know, to, to address their access to land, their issues about understanding their own situation, um, not in a confrontational way. And he doesn't even talk about the word human rights, uh, knowing that the word is taboo here, uh, because rights is supposed to be given to you by the government, and it's only the rights that you get is only what is endorsed by the authority. So he uses practical means, but I guess even in that very um, try to be non-confrontation way of working, it might have um, uh, annoyed some people. Or some people probably think that this could lead to him being um, considered a leader. And nobody can be a leader in Laos except the authority. No, and you really brought up the points that we feel here in Hawaii as well, Malama Honua, to take care of each other and our earth and understanding that our fates are intertwined as we stand up for one another and take care of each other, but also for our planet. And it's a very fragile planet. Really, the UDH Article 10 ensures full equality regarding hearings related to any charges. And the UDHR outlines the opportunities for a new way forward for our world. And the UDHR serves as a valuable vision rooted in rule of law with basic rights and fundamental freedoms. Phil, could you share with us maybe your vision for the future of this right? Well, I think ultimately we need to be uh, pushing very hard uh, for uh, effective judicial reform that takes judiciaries out of the control of these political parties and these governments. I mean, what we want to see is we want to see an independent judiciary that is able to uphold rule of law, that is able to be appealed to uh, by poor people, by people who have lost their rights, and and to be able to demand justice. Um, and when people are being accused of crimes, that they should be, uh, you know, adjudicated fairly and independently. Uh, you know, and not just become a rubber stamp. I mean, it, you know, cr it creates cynicism around issues of uh, rule of law when these courts are not independent. Thank you, Phil. And Shuming, your final vision for the future of this important right? I think, um, you know, for many people in Laos, um, having an independent judiciary is, of course, one of the most important right they have and um but we are so far away from it that getting information out to people in whatever form and uh you know we should we should be talking about um the universal declaration of human rights not as a once a year event uh but to make it real into our everyday life and that depends very much on people on the ground. Uh, we have to be uh, protectors of our own rights and we have to talk about our rights and also um, educate our, our friends, neighbors, uh, if they are ignorant about what their rights are, to stand up for them. For me, in Laos, that's the only way that we can get the information out. Go at it day by day, stand up for it, be an example for it. And even though, I mean, in, in the case of Sombat, it's such a tragedy, I hope that he will remain a strong symbol of how an ordinary person can work and do what they need to do uh, to stand up for their own rights and also the rights of the families and the communities. Thank you so much. And I know that Sombat Sopon definitely inspired me, but also an entire generation of people in Laos and around the world to really achieve the Paris Agreement and the UN 2030 agenda ahead of his time. And we thank you so much for all the work that you both do to ensure Article 10 and all 30 articles of the UDHR. Mahalo. Thank you. Mahalo. Thank you.